This episode of the podcast is presented by Knowing Hospitality, a full-service hotel management and consulting company that works directly with hotel owners and managers to help stabilize their properties and take on projects that are critical to their operation. Knowing Hospitality can be the extra set of hands that you need to make sure your hotel is best positioned for today's environment. Visit knowinghospitality.com to learn more. Now let's get to the podcast. What will happen, the the bigger question is always, how do you price when there's really no demand? Is it rate dumping or is it pricing where the demand is? Welcome to the Proven Principles Podcast, the show that deconstructs the inner workings of the hospitality industry, breaking down the tools, tips, and tricks that the world's best-run hotels use every day. Here's your host, Adam Knight. My guest today is Fabian Bartnick. He's the founder of Infinito, a technology company dedicated to improving the work-life balance of hotel managers through Ivy, a personal revenue management assistant. The discipline of revenue management is both scientific and artistic, and the idea of using a virtual AI assistant to help change user behavior and take the guesswork out of rate decisions is an interesting one. Revenue management is at the heart of many hotel business conversations right now. Fabian shows us how to make better decisions about hotel performance and why we shouldn't leave this critical function to chance. So let's get to it. This is episode 27 of the Proven Principles podcast, Fabian Bartnick on optimizing revenue management through AI. Enjoy. Fabian, it is uh, fantastic to have you on the show, man. Thanks for doing this. Thank you uh, for for having me. Uh, Great pleasure. Great pleasure. What are we talking about? We're talking about revenue management. Let's make it exciting, man. Yeah, no, no. Let's put the fun into revenue management. Eh? <laughs> yeah, that's put the F-U-N in revenue management. So why don't you give everybody your background story, your origin story? How did you uh, come up in the industry and get to where you are today? I kind of went into it because I didn't know what else to do. So I came to graduation in college and my dad, he asked me the right question. He said, what are you going to do? And I said, I have no idea. And then I saw this little, little advertisement in one of those uh, brochures that says, what do you want to do after high school? And it said, oh, learn about hotels. I came home and I was like, you know what? We stayed in hotels before. I really enjoyed that. It's glamorous. It's nice. Why don't I start? And so I I started my studies in different countries. So Australia, Switzerland, which was great because it was fully international. Mm -hmm. So it gave you already that first vibe of globalization. I come from a small town. So from that perspective, it was great to see all those different cultures mixed with each other, which which you knew about, but you never experienced. And I thought, oh, that's that's really cool. And all of a sudden, I realized that when I'm actually interested in stuff, I can be very good at it. It's different to when you go through high school and you have to read this book and then you have to do write a conclusion about it and you really just want to strangle yourself. Couldn't agree more. So all of a sudden, it was like, oh, tequila tasting at 10 a.m. in the morning. Sweet. I'm up for that. And so learned the entire food and beverage, went then over and did finance, everything else. And then realized, you know what? Do I want to continue another two years or do I want to finish the diploma and go into a management training? And I think that was most probably the best decision I've ever taken was to go into that on-the-job learning. So Mm -hmm. I got the foundations from an educational perspective, which allowed me to give a a little bit of a head start by just understanding stuff much faster because I didn't have to learn it a second time. And then really just going in, but realized that after some time, operations is quite tough. Weekends, I mean, I understand why 70, 80% of the people that studied with me drop out in the first kind of two years. But I did food and beverage, I did front office, and then I moved into reservations and then revenue management. I never understood why my manager back in the day fought so hard to get the revenue manager title. And I was like, nobody has an idea of what what revenue people do anyway. Early days. Yeah, yeah. it was a bit bizarre. And then I kind of got a job offer as a a revenue person. And I always had luck that I had people that had the sink and swim attitude. So I give you more and either you can handle the situation or you can't, but you're not going to be in your comfort zone. And once I've did that and looked after multiple properties, I then moved on over to uh, a revenue management provider and worked for them for a couple of years in Europe, in Asia, and then kind of had the feeling that I needed to go back into hotels. 
and an opportunity came up. I went over. It was a great opportunity from a revenue generation perspective. But then realized again after some time, you know what? Actually, this tech stuff is a lot of fun. And it's a lot of fun because you're building something that somebody else can use to become better. And I think that's where it becomes really, really powerful. And so I joined a startup out of the US and then decided after some time, you know what, now it's time to build what I've always wanted to build. Because I was, I always had the feeling something is missing when you look at the revenue space. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's interesting. And so that's how you ended up becoming a tech founder. You went from Correct. hotel operations guy to tech founder, and you did it in a way where you were kind of trying to solve your own problem almost, or at least using your experience in knowing what was missing in the market and trying to put a solution out there that was going to help people do their jobs a little bit better, especially in this emerging at the time field of revenue management. You said something interesting, do their job better. I actually... In a way, yes. In a way, no. I want you to do better. There's a mm. fundamental difference between me giving you a tool that you can use and get better. Uh, sorry, that you can use and you can you do your job better. But what if I can do something that makes you better? And that's, that's what's so interesting about the conversation that we had, well, it's probably about four weeks ago now, about yep. what, you're, what you're working on. So can you give everybody an overview of what Infinito is and this personal assistant that you're working yeah. on, this Ivy product. We have built Ivy, which is a virtual revenue management assistant. We want Ivy to really help you become better. Better in the sense of get a better understanding, kind of like having a wingman that supports you and has your back. If we look at it very simplistically, there's, for me, there's always three levels in the entire cycle. One is a visualization aspect. So you take data and you turn it into tables, you sort it, you cleanse it, and you come out with, with pretty graphs. Those are the dashboards. Those are the reportings that have been around for a longer time. But essentially, it's the same thing, different format. It's something presented to a user. But then already we're going into the analysis part. So now all of a sudden you're flipping the script because you're handing it over to the user and you're putting it into the user's capabilities, mm -hmm. hands, into the capabilities. And we are not all created equal. We're not created equal because we have different backgrounds, different experiences, different filters that we look at. There's a saying that if you give 20 revenue managers the same data set, your chances are you get 15 different outcomes. <laughs> and that has to do with the analysis, but then taking it further, the interpretation of it. It's where your filters go through. And then you do the optimization. Here's the tricky part. If I don't understand how you came up to that optimization, if I have to make up everything in my mind, how do you expect me to say yes or no to that optimization? Fair enough. If you are a person that believes in 100%, I'm going to switch on the system and do an autopilot. That's fantastic. You're giving a lot of trust to the technology and it can work or it can't work. It certainly gives a lot of automation benefits. Which, on, right? I mean, not, not to cut you off, but that's, for existing revenue management platforms, that's the selling feature for a lot of them, where you, it's, you it's don't have to think I, about it. It's interesting. I had a conversation with somebody the other day, and they were like, yeah, I'm scared of not having a system because if I take it out, then my revenue managers, I think the one thing that they're missing is that click the button and it updates everywhere. I fully get that. I'm coming from a different angle. I say, okay, you do all of this optimization only to give it to the user and say, user, say yes or no to it. So after all that optimization, it's still Adam who has to make that decision. And it's only as good as Adam is, is the yes or no. And we are jumping exactly on that. So I was like, why don't we fix the yes and no problem? How can I make Adam be better at the yeses and no's. Then you're going down to the automation. But if the automation is the only thing you have to bring to the table as a revenue management system, I don't think you should be a revenue management system mm -hmm. because your power comes from the analytics that are sitting there giving you a better price recommendation. We're not taking the user on the journey. It's like data in, black box, here we go, accept or deny. And the user goes, but how did you get there? 
we're going on that part. It's we're going really, on really how interesting. Can we turn data into stories so that I can help you acquire more knowledge, make more money, be in the know, and really make it purpose driven. Our system is really designed around purpose. What happens in your daily life that we can take off your shoulders? A lot of times somebody asks you a question mm -hmm. and it drives you bonkers. Oh, sorry, I got to go back to my desk. And that's all it takes. But we need to understand you, the user, in order to help you make better decisions. You had this interesting story, anecdote, or uh, not really an anecdote, but like a, a use case scenario when we talked last time about the hotel that always had their revenue meeting on was it Tuesdays? Oh yeah, my, my favorite one. That's an unbelievable story. What, could you maybe give everybody a, a quick rundown of that? Because it illustrates what you're talking about so beautifully. We had this person telling us, you know what, something here is wrong. You always tell us we're, we're having really good pickup on a Tuesday and then you say our Wednesdays are really down and our Thursdays are, are getting up again. And I said, y yes. Yeah, that's not right. And I mm -hmm. said, well, let's have a look at it. When do you have your revenue meetings? Oh, we always have that at 4 p.m. every Tuesday. Okay, cool. So we looked at the amount of rate changes that are being done. And guess what? Tuesday at around 5.36, highest amount of rate changes. Across any day of week, it doesn't matter if you slice it over a trending period or spot checks, all of a sudden it was, yeah. And most of it was increases which makes sense because you had a really good pickup day. Mm -hmm. You always looked at the data in the same perspective. So dopamine kicks in and says, really good day, really happy. Let's, let's be bullish. And then every Wednesday, the pickup just died. And then every Thursday morning, we saw a reversal of rate changes to a lower level than Tuesday before the meeting. And mm. pickup went back up. The interesting thing is when I talk to revenue managers about it, a lot of them start laughing and they were like, oh, yeah, <laughs> they know. I know. Or even, <laughs> or even some people tell me, oh, I know what happens on a Thursday morning. And then some blame it on the GM or the director of marketing or my hands are tied. And I go, no, guys, you are all in the same. If you don't hit budget, you're all screwed. It's not one against the other. You're all there for the same thing. But I said, your problem is not rate optimization. Your problem at the moment is a business process that is hindering your business. Stop having a revenue meeting at 4 p.m. on a Tuesday and shift it maybe to a Friday and a Monday. Or God forbid, you always find a new place with a different thing and your problem is solved. Mm -hmm. Did I optimize your rates? No, I just changed your behavior for the better. That's truly powerful if you see those things then in action where you can see, okay, we always think optimization equals price optimization. No, optimization equally means if I can take a decision earlier than other times, mm -hmm. if I can proactively make a move, if I know that Adam will make his move tomorrow, can I do a, can I do a move now? Or is it better for me to let Adam make the move? And I always say, if you change your your rates at 10 o'clock in the morning, but all your comp set changes their rates at 11, they have the upper hand. It doesn't mean that they make better decisions. It just means that they have fresher data and a more up-to-date playing field to make their decisions. There was this person in, I think it was Bangkok. So a person in Bangkok was actually quite clever and quite naughty uh, at the same time. So essentially 5 p.m. moved all the rates up. So the entire comp set went like, oh my God, yeah, let's move the rates up. Went to the gym, about 7, 7.30, comes back, drops all of the rate again. And it was just purely a decoy because now all of the other competitors for the late night pickup or the evening pickup essentially outpriced themselves against. Huh, interesting right? strategy. It's an interesting strategy. It's debatable if it works or not. It's just an interesting way of how they are trying to optimize. They're not optimizing by thinking, ooh, let me price optimize. They're looking by how can I steal share from my competitors by tricking them. So what do you think it is then? Because the concept of revenue management is very, it's, it's relatively simple to get your head around. Which oh, for if, those you of drill, you... if you drill it down, it's supply and demand and then different factors throwing in. And based on that, you just 
come with him. Exactly. So, exactly. So at a, at a high level, it's pretty simple, but it's really hard to grasp. It's really hard. All you have to do is go a level deeper and be responsible for either making decisions on your rate or interpreting data. And that's really hard to do. So what do you think it is that is, it's really hard to do for, for a lot of people. And given the 80% plus stat of hotels don't have any sort of sophisticated system in place, that's pretty evident. What do you think it is about revenue management that is just so difficult to get your arms around? The way we have positioned it, to be honest. Um, we started off always having those number crunches and then all of a sudden saying, oh, we don't need those number crunches. We really need strategies. And then you kind of go like, oh, but the strategist doesn't possibly understand the numbers. So how can that happen? We're pivoting and flip-flopping the entire time. What do we actually need as a, as a revenue person to be? Because all of a sudden it's like, oh, you also got to do marketing. Oh, and you also got to do conversions. Convergence of disciplines. We're talking since, crikey, 2009, 11 years now? Make it eight, nine years. And still hasn't happened. We're talking... Right. Total revenue management. We're talking GoPa. Guys, 80% of the industry is still not using that stuff. So mm-hmm. why, why you want to go further and further and further down the line? Yes, don't get me wrong. There is the user base that requires high-end analytics in the sense of they're really into it. They're really working with it. They fully get it, right? But then you have the rest of the industry that A, you could argue might not need something. All they need is maybe a, a pickup report and some competitive say, rate shopping thrown in. But then again, they equally want to know if they need to do something or not. People don't know what they need to do. So when you're talking about it, and I, I, don't, I won't name any brands. I think those in the industry know who the big, the big boys are when it comes to revenue management systems. But one of the core functions of those systems is usually that it will give rate recommendations. So how is what you're talking about, Ivy, what does it do differently than what some of those typical and what I would maybe call legacy revenue management systems will do? When I have conversations, I say, so from a revenue perspective, are you going to change your strategy if you're 81 or 81.5%? No, but your algorithm will most probably make you 20 cents more. Mm. And yes, I'm simplifying it to the point that you're not completely mispositioned in the market and everything else. But we approach that slightly different. We say, listen, we we all talk about RevPA. That's fantastic. But let's face it. If you had 30% occupancy, the question is not, oh, great. My forecast says 30% at a rate of $120. Okay, Adam, bye. You can go home. That forecast is not optimized for me because you don't need to do anything and the business will continue. And yes, there will be modifications around, but you haven't done a game changer. Mm -hmm. Let me do something to shock the system. Mm -hmm. Not talking $5, $2. Have you tried putting $80 on your rate? Maybe you're completely mispositioned. Maybe you're coming into the market where the US is booking and therefore they have a higher perception of prices. So you can get a, not get away with a $150 instead of $120, but they have a different value perception. From a strategy perspective, you only need to know if you're not filling, if you have access demand, or if you're in that sweet spot where you could potentially fill in, it's really up to your fine tuning. And that's a starting point for us. If I give you a number, you're going to argue the toss about the number and it doesn't change anything. You might have sit in revenue meetings and you talk for three hours and then you kind of go, Uh, So how much should we put the rate up? Oh, yeah, $5. What was interesting, we have an emoji board. And people say like, oh, yeah, but that's funny. But I said a data set only has three faces. It's Mm -hmm. irrelevant. It's against you. It's for you. And you won't know for the next 365 days, every hour of the day, which data set is smiling at you and which one is against you. Chances are, if we're bringing it to the test, if you're getting north of 50, you can already be really, really happy of understanding how you are positioned on that front. We had revenue managers turn around and say, what do you mean I did good? And I was like, well, sorry, (laughs) what did you mean by I did good? And I said, yeah, you can put a dollar maybe on your rate or $2, but fundamentally, 
You have done the right thing. You have identified that you have more demand. Your comp set validated that there's more demand and you equally moved your rates up. But you only moved them up by $20. What if I told you that without jeopardizing your positioning, you can put another $10, $15 on top. Here are some things where you have done it in the past. It's not rewarding you, but telling you, you know what? You're actually doing okay. I'm not saying you can't do better, but I'm saying you're doing good right now. You're really bringing in the psychological aspects of behavior and decision-making into the science. You're trying, to, you're trying to do a better job of marrying the art and the science of revenue management. What did I read the other, the other day? Talent times effort equals skill. Skill times effort equals success. So a painter who does art has a certain talent. They see the canvas differently to you and me. But without effort, without training, without more painting, they're not building a skill. But once you have that skill and you paint more and more, you're becoming an athlete. And it's the same in revenue management. I don't know your talent, but I know you're doing your best. So the thing that that equation is missing is the outside forces. If you're not talented, but I give you a, a kick-ass coach, mm -hmm. you can get to a certain level. You might never be a pro athlete, but I can get you to the best of your capabilities. That's right. That's what we want to do. We are that outside force that says, I don't know your talent, but I know you want to put in the effort. Let me show you how it's done. Let me, let me tell you when you're doing good. So what do you say to the revenue managers? And I, well, not just revenue managers, actually, because this is often driven by, uh, by GMs, by asset managers, is directors of sales and marketing. The RevPAR index tends to be the stat that rules the day when it comes to revenue management. I think that it's long overdue that that changes. I think we're probably going to see change in that and moving to a different metric as we kind of move through this pandemic. But what do you say to that revenue manager or that GM that says, I already know how good I'm doing because we're performing at this level against our comp set. And you just look at our rep bar index and that'll tell you that we're doing well. Why do I need to go out and spend a lot of time and energy in figuring out optimizing my revenue management game when I'm already indexing over 100? Okay. My general question is, whose comp set is it? I can create your comp set that you're always at a 160, 170. Exactly. Not a problem. It's very subjective. I meet the next person and they tell me a different comp set and all of a sudden, oh, yeah, yeah, but they're not really our comp set. Why you've got not? the I HMA just... comp set. You've got, you know, comp set two. You've got, yeah. But that's the whole thing. COVID has shown up one thing and I call it the 2021 challenge. The rules have changed. The game has changed. We don't even know who's playing the game anymore. Isn't that the truth? But yet, but yet we're going to say, referee, use the old rule book and tell us what needs to be done. If you can't win, change the rules. If you can't change the rules, ignore them. And the RGI stuff, it's fantastic. It's a clap on the shoulder that once a month, you look at that score, or even you might look at it daily, and you look yep. at it reperspective. Weekly, yeah. And you say, look how well we did last week. Okay, where's the other hundred thousand dollars I need to hit budget because I can't do the repayments? Can't take rough part yes, of the Yes, I bank. understand we have to measure ourselves, but it's already flawed from the get go that not all hotels that I want might be participating, or that if I change the comp set, my results will be completely different. The comp set gives me a comfort factor. Nothing great was achieved by being in your comfort zone. You could argue right now that every hotel in your city is your comp set. Demand is so depressed, travel is down. Everybody's competing on rate by and large. You're competing against every hotel in your city. Yeah, I, I think some. What will happen, the, the bigger question is always how do you price when there's really no demand? Is it rate dumping or is it pricing where the demand is? If right. people have less and then... Oh, yeah, but then we're jeopardizing our positioning. Yeah, but the guy who did is full. My you, hotels, I always say, you know what? At the end of the day, I'm not, I'm not for dropping your rates and dropping your pants and doing that. 
But at the end of the day is if I know that I have a trigger and I switch it on and I go to 100% for Friday night, see it as a gift to those travelers that you would never take. That person will never stay on a Saturday night. That person will never stay on a Tuesday or Wednesday because that's when I can yield up. Right. But on the other days, if I can, and we did test, those people you got in, guess what? They spent a lot in the food and beverage outlets. Right. So overall, they made more money. But then on the other hand, you go to other parts of the world and you are, say, RGI or Ref by Index, and they look at you like you're a sorcerer. So from that perspective, we also need to put a bit of reality onto it that some markets have more data than other. And unfortunately, either you have a data overload or you really just don't have enough data or even worse, they're still calling each other and then everybody lies to each other and saying, yeah, I was full last night. You, yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. It's so funny. The point about data visualization, I think is, is so powerful in taking all of this noise that really is what it is. It's just sort of flies past you all these numbers and being able to tell a story based off of the information that's in front of you. And data visualization does that beautifully. But I think the other side of the coin is you have to factor in confirmation bias in making decisions. And what I mean by that is going out and finding the data to support the point that you're trying to make. And I've sat in many revenue meetings over the years where data will be cherry picked to prove a point about a decision that somebody feels very strongly needs to be made. And I can only imagine that in these times when hotels are competing on rate, we've already talked about competing on rate, most likely you're competing against hotels outside of your comp set. You're just trying to get a share of a smaller pie. That there are revenue managers and GMs out there that feel very strongly that their way of doing things is best. And they will ram down the throats of everybody who's listening to them until their ideal outcome is put in place or their, the decision to get to their ideal outcome is put in place. So how do you combat that? Does Ivy account for that? I guess is really the crux of the question. Ivy essentially puts the normality into a time when there's no normality and it's creating a base normal and then essentially turning around and saying, has it changed or not? Even more, so it changed. So what? We're looking at from multiple rings. Something happened. So what happened? What of this did impact me? Of the stuff that impacted me, what do I actually need to focus on? And what I need to focus on, where do I need to take an action for? And if you go through those simple steps, a lot of times you realize you're coming to the end of it and no action required. We're taking it to the end and say, here's the reason why there shouldn't be an action. But right? Fabian, we have to take an action. We have to do something. Not doing something is equally an action. <laughs> exactly. and that's what we forget. When I said earlier, I went back into hotels and then wanted to go back into tech. Another thing was that I had to write action plans over action plans. And I had to make numbers fit. And you kind of sit there and go like, I'll never achieve that. And I know mm -hmm. that already. And then three months later, but you put the plan together. And right. you kind of go like, thanks for reminding me. Right. Uh, so we right. really, we are, we are putting transparency into it. The difficult thing about being the narrator and writing the story is exactly as you said, you can, you can twist the characters being the data sets mm -hmm. the way you want them to. And the other people in the room look to you because you're the expert. So whatever you say, it's like going on LinkedIn and declaring you're you a self-help guru. All of a sudden... People will assume you're not lying. You're a self help guru, exactly. right? And all of a sudden, you say it loud enough. Lying. Say it long enough. Correct. And you not even that. You start believing in yourself. Exactly. And it's the same when we tell revenue management stories. And I know we're 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 grossly generalizing here. Of okay? course. Is it you can essentially take the data you want to support your argument? I see it all the time. I see it all and the time. And then you have to defend or get buy-in from the rest of your management committee in the hotel. Mm -hmm. And then the GM has to go to the next person. And then they have to go to the next person. Right. And all those people, the higher you go, the less detail they want. 
<laughs> That's true. A CEO of IHG will not sit there and go like uh, the Holiday Inn down in uh, wherever some city. Yeah. So tell me exactly your segmentation mix and how that has changed. No. They're most probably even going to stop at which of my brands is performing well, which of the cities is performing well, and therefore looking at those different. And I think one thing that, that we do different is we want you to get to that space much, much faster, but that you are able to tell the story. Mm-hmm. You don't have to make up the story. You will be given the story in a format that you can easily digest it, read through it, even copy and paste it and send it to your boss. We want you to be better and we want you to be the rock star. We don't need the fame. Netflix doesn't clap every time you watch Cobra Kai, but it recommends very quickly to do the next thing. Exactly. We should do the same thing. Hey, can you do this? Okay, now can you do this? Now can you do this? And some part is just, I know you want to do something, but don't worry. Here's why you don't need to do anything. You talk with hotels and revenue managers all over the world. You have a yeah. good idea of what's going on in, at a macro level in a lot of different markets. Where does revenue management need to evolve? And is there, are there any learnings that have started to come out of COVID that are maybe some new, new principles or new practices that we should be looking at adopting in this art i think we have put too much emphasis on the art and less on the science we said as an industry you do the art let the science do the science Mm -hmm. but the person who does the art needs to understand the science in order to apply the art it's coming back to what i said earlier from a perspective of i can't separate the talent and the effort to create a skill I think if we look at other industries, they clearly have analysts who crunch that data, give recommendations, and give an overall view on that. And we still require those those functions. But we just try to chuck too much into that. We had to chuck too much into that person and saying, no, 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 now you got to be this. Now you got to do that. Now you got to do this. Now you got to do that. And I find that I find that a bit unfair because we're kind of making it up as we go along. Right? And it's also tricky for revenue management system providers that all of a sudden it's like, A, what is a revenue management system? Does a rate shopper or now rate intelligence tool mm-hmm. qualify as a revenue system? Chances are if you're a revenue system, we say no, because it's a doesn't have the algorithms, it just gives you stuff. But does it help somebody make more money? Yes, it does. So it helps with the revenue management. It does help a person make better decisions to drive more money into Mm -hmm. the property. Mm -hmm. So it's this entire spectrum of how we define it and what goes into it. I mean, now the new flavor is business intelligence. Everybody goes around business intelligence. You have the same problem. You're giving the data set and the visualization to somebody who might not be able to read it. Okay, so that's so where we not, need to go. We're not helping people be better. There is that's, a science to it, but somebody got to understand the science or the output in order to then say, I can do something with it because I understand why you did that. Helping make people better is ultimately what this is all about. And I, I think it's, it's nice that the whole conversation comes full circle there, that no matter how you look at this, the goal is to help get people better. Correct. Last question. What do you want revenue managers out there to know? I think, A, we don't know what revenue management will evolve into, if it will still exist in two years' time, if it's still needed or it's being replaced. Technology is not there to replace you. You're not going to be all of a sudden having to fear for life because you're bringing in a system. But you also got to be realistic to see where are my capabilities at the moment and where can I do better? And you don't have to say that to anyone. Mm -hmm. You don't have to all of a sudden go out and say like, I don't know how to analyze. But find a way on getting better on that part. 
So see technology as a way to make you better, as something that should complement you, as something that makes you shine in the best light. Because guess what? That technology doesn't need a job next week. You do. It's not going to say, how do I put food on the table for my other code mm-hmm. lines? So ultimately, it's about you. What's in it for me if I apply that technology in my hotel? And it's coming. That technology is coming. We're already doing it. Yeah. Right? But if it's not in your hotel, it will be at some point. So learn how to use it. Learn how to adopt it into what you do. Use it to the best of your, but its ability. Get better and it'll push the whole science and art of the discipline forward. Yeah. Or it will separate it. Like, why wouldn't you want to have a commercial person and then a hardcore analytics person? Why wouldn't we want more data scientists in the role of a revenue manager? I want people to know that there's hope in spite of everything that's going on in our industry, which over and above the pandemic, that there are tools out there that are going to help you do a better job at what you go in and do every day. Or there's tools that you can learn that are going to help you become marketable to get a new job if you're out of one when our industry comes back. And I think your point about marrying the two is really powerful. Thank you. If people want to get to know you a little bit more, get to know your company, find you online, what's a good place for them to go? LinkedIn. Easiest. Easiest. It's like the the Tinder of the professional world, right? Yeah. Um, (laughs) Yeah. That's right. I'll link to it in the show notes. I'll I'll put your profile in there so people can reach out. That's the easiest one. Just ping me and then we'll have a conversation. We'll go from there. That's great stuff. Hey, Fabian, thanks so much for being on the show today. This was fantastic. Thank you. This was our episode with Fabian Bartnick, founder of Infinito. You can learn more about him and his company on LinkedIn. I'll link to his profile in the show notes. To see the full interview, just search the Proven Principles podcast on YouTube. You can also learn more about the show on our website, theprovenprinciplespodcast.com. This show is produced by Knowing Hospitality, a full-service hotel management and consulting company. Head over to knowinghospitality.com to learn more. Thanks again for listening. Until next time. For past episodes, show notes, or if you've got a story that might make a great episode, head on over to theprovenprinciplespodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. You can subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts, even on YouTube. And if you haven't already, don't forget to leave us a rating and a review. Thanks for listening to the Proven Principles Podcast.